everyone, and it's uh, delightful to be here in person with real people <laughs> talking about hugely important issues. So let me first congratulate the Bennett Institute for what I hear has been a deeply stimulating day. Packed with extraordinary insight from leading thinkers across the Institute's four research pillars, place, progress, productivity, and decision-making in government. And that, of course, is what we're going to be focusing on, I think, primarily uh, this evening, or at least how government receives advice that helps it decide. All four of the themes play increasingly significant and interconnected roles in our very complex world. And I do say that in Cambridge, we are immensely fortunate to host a vibrant research community working to make sense of pressing public policy questions, particularly focused here around the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. The Institute, as many of you know, was established in 2018, thanks to the visionary philanthropy of Peter Bennett, and we'll hear more from him later. It's dedicated to addressing the patterns of inequality that pervade our societies. As an interdisciplinary center, the Bennett Institute is founded on the belief that no single social issue is isolated from any other, and nor is any state alone in the challenges that they face. If anything, the world is smaller now than ever before, and many of our challenges are, of course, transnational. The relationship between politics and economics and the role of experts in policy decisions has rightly been under intense scrutiny over the last months and years. And it's been particularly evident in everything associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. The global health crisis shone a spotlight on some of the most difficult decisions government has had to make in recent memory. It placed scientific advice center stage and made all of us more prepared to interrogate it. I suspect you felt that quite often, Patrick. For example, asking whether the advice was settled or unsettled, inclusive of many views or unique, timely or not. How can scientific advisors for better or worse deal with that type of scrutiny how can the scientific advisory system learn from the experience of the coronavirus crisis? Is there scope to improve both the provision of evidence on which policy decisions are based and the way that data is communicated to the wider public? Well, these questions speak directly to the work of many people with us today. But few people have had to grapple with those questions as closely as today's keynote speaker. So I'm delighted to welcome Sir Patrick Valance to bring us some unique insight and reflection on the topic, why does science matter for policymaking? Following Sir Patrick's remarks, there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. And for online guests, please do submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Sir Patrick's been the UK government's chief scientific advisor since 2018, and he has over 20 years experience of basic and clinical research focusing on diseases of the blood vessels and was a consultant physician in the NHS, then going on to be a professor of medicine and head of the medical division at UCL. An extraordinarily distinguished career as president of R&D at GlaxoSmithKline and lots of really deep engagement with public science from both a university and a private sector perspective. Then of course, going on uh, to this unique role which uh, it brings him to us this evening. He, of course, was well known to many people here before the pandemic, but he's become a household name for good or ill as one of the public officials communicating government policy during the pandemic. Probably not a role you ever suspected you would fulfill. Well, nothing more needs to be said except that from all of us, I do think it's fair to extend a very, very heartfelt thank you, Patrick, 
for the efforts that you've made in public leadership in science and health in probably the most difficult circumstances of our era. So thank you very much for being with us. And now to use a phrase that you have helped make famous, next slide, please. <laughs> Sir Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen, for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the end of what I know has been an incredibly interesting and I think important day. And I caught certainly the last session and got a feel for the types of things that have been covered. And as Stephen said, you've covered place, productivity, progress, decision-making in government. And what I want to do is to touch on one aspect of this. And that is why does science matter for policymaking and what needs to be done to ensure that science advice into government is as effective as it should be. I'm taking a broad definition of science. So I'm not talking about just the physical sciences or the medical sciences. I'm talking about social science, humanities, the broad definition, including, of course, all of the physical sciences, biological sciences. The definition that was used by Paul Nurse in his uh, report that led to the formation of UKRI, and I'm also going to speak about R&D. Predominantly, I want to talk about science for policy rather than policy for science. I will at the end, though, say a word about policy for science. So why does it matter? If you look at the origins of the role that I now have, the government chief scientific advisor, they start really in the Second World War. And it was a recognition during the war that science advice had been crucial for various aspects of planning, policy, and delivery that led to the creation of initially a science advisor role in the Ministry of Defense, and then the government chief scientific advisor role. And the thinking was, well, if it's been useful during a crisis, perhaps it could be useful during peacetime as well. And it's definitely the case whenever you look anywhere across the world that science advice is something that comes to the fore during a crisis. And of course, the last two and a half years have been no exception. But I challenge you actually to look at any area of policy and ask, is there some way you can find that science isn't relevant? Think about transport. The whole of DFT needs to think about types of transport, future modes of transport, smart movement around cities, how all of that can be done in a carbon neutral way. All difficult scientific and engineering problems. Housing, buildings, how we insulate them, how we think about designing and ensuring both buildings that can be resilient to climate, don't contribute to climate change, and indeed are infection resistant. How we think about digital planning and the implications that that has. Net zero, one of the massive challenges and one of the persistent challenges that all governments will face has science woven throughout it from behavioral science right the way through to engineering solutions every aspect and indeed the whole problem itself is one of a system and therefore systems engineering systems thinking and the science behind that is critical if we're to tackle net zero immigration migration the causes the changes to the demography that leads to pressures on migration the changes in the environment that will lead to changes in the way people want to move from places. The detection and the detection of things like modern slavery and thinking about paths, all of these require science input. Education, of course, the education department needs to think about the skills of the future, but also the way in which we think about ensuring that every child gets the appropriate tools and necessary approaches to fulfill their potential builds on neuroscience and many other areas that will be increasingly important. How we communicate with each other, the devices we use, the privacy we demand, these all have big science implications. And of course, other very obvious ones like health and how we 
think and seek our health treatments, what we want from the NHS, what we want in terms of prevention, how we think about the food system and the implication that ha that has, or even the Department of Work and Pensions, how they think about what's going to happen to the population and therefore how they should be planning. I can't think of a single department, a single area, where there isn't a science, technology, or engineering aspect that needs to be considered. So science is important for the economy, for national security, clearly for emergencies and resilience, for well-being, and for societal benefit. So a government without science capability is a disabled government. And as an aside on the economy, eight out of the 10 top businesses in the world are heavily reliant upon intangible assets, intellectual property. Investors know this, and those investors who've spotted it have done very well, and countries know this. So anyone who dreams that there's an economy which isn't going to be heavily influenced by what happens to science and technology companies, I think is dreaming. They're going to be incredibly important for nations right the way across the world. So what is the state of play in the UK government? Before I took up this role, I went to ask advice from a number of people. Some of it was useful, some of it much less so. But one person who was extremely useful was Gus O'Donnell, a previous cabinet secretary. And Gus said to me, his view was that science was good in parts across government. There were places of real excellence. There were places where it was strong, but it was certainly not ubiquitous across government. It wasn't equally strong and it wasn't embedded. And his point was that 50 years ago, economics wasn't embedded in government, but it certainly is now. And it's inconceivable in a department that there wouldn't be some form of economic analysis. And his advice was science, the rest of science should be as embedded as that is, and should be as much part of everyday life in government as that is. When I took up the role, the first thing, one of the early things I did was to ask the question, what are the capabilities in terms of people, resources in government around science? And I looked at the fast stream. So the uh, system that brings bright young people into government and gives them a fast track through to a position and often is the place that leaders of the future in government come from. And I asked the question, in this case, taking a narrower definition of science, what proportion of those fast stream entrants had a STEM degree? And the answer was 10%. Now, I don't know what the right answer is, and it's certainly not that it should be 90%, but I'm absolutely sure 10% is not the right answer. And you could argue perhaps 50-50 is a reasonable position. So there is a, a deficit in terms of the people coming into government with science, technology, engineering expertise. Government budgets for R&D had decreased by about 20% between 2005 and 2011, stabilized a bit thereafter, but many departments continued to see a decrease in their own R&D and science budgets. Looking at the percentage of annual spend in a department and asking what percentage of that was spent on R&D, in some departments, the figure is a fraction of 1%. Now, if you were a company and you said, I choose to spend a fraction of 1% on R&D, you have defined yourself as a no growth commodity organization, not something that has an ambition to grow an ambition to make a difference. And so not spending on R&D is I think a route for stagnation and therefore that needs to change. We published in 2019 something called the Science Capability Review to try and draw some of these strands together and ask the question, what needs to be done to try to get science in government in a way that's useful for policymakers? And there were sort of four broad areas that were covered. Um, we said that every department needs to define its science system. It needs to say how it's going to use science because 
Absent that, the tendency is to think, I've got a scientist somewhere. I've got a scientific question. I'll go and find the scientist. And that's not what we mean. There needs to be a system to embed science in a department. We ask that departments publish their areas of research interest. So these are the questions to which departments would like to know the answer, but don't know the answer. Why is that important? Because it brings everybody else in. And actually, DWP is one of the departments that's done this really well and went on a roadshow around universities in the UK saying these are our problems that we don't know the answer to. And as a result, we've had lots of people working on their problems. So defining what the areas of research interest are, are important. And the other general point under this heading was funding. They must say what percentage of their total revenue is spent on R&D. And we're going to get to that um, uh, at some point, which I think will be useful because it will show which direction things are moving in. And I will say after the spending review this year, departments actually got a very significant uplift in terms of most departments, a very significant uplift in terms of departmental um, science spend. Second area is people, skills and tools. And, and, and here, of course, it's not just about how many scientists and engineers you bring into government, but it's also about the capability of those in government to use science and technology to be good customers. And that actually requires capacity building across government because everybody needs to know when to turn, how to use, how to use scientists and engineers in the day-to-day -day business. And it requires not only the skills, but also the tools. And I'll come back to that point in terms of data visualization. I'll tell you a story though about one, uh, director general in, in government who told me that uh, a couple of years before she uh, was running a very policy-based team and one of the science and engineering fast streamers was allocated to her team. And she told me her initial reaction was, what the hell am I going to do with this person? I don't have science and technology in this policy area. But about six weeks later, when this person had been in most meetings, she realized that he was asking different questions, approaching problems from a different angle, worrying about things like experimentation, and that it had changed the dynamic of the team and actually had helped her to deliver the problem against the problem she was trying to tackle at the time. The third area is the public sector research establishments. And many people may not be aware of these dotted around the country. So there is an interesting place and leveling up angle to this. We have public sector research establishments, some of them very well known, like the Met Office, some of them less well known, CFAS, which works on fisheries and, and aquaculture. But these are, I think, undervalued national resources which need to be more visible, more part of the system and more linked through to universities as well, actually, and provide a very strong local link through to businesses. So these labs, many of which have monitoring functions, also undertake quite significant research and have an opportunity to feed in to policy. And the final area it touched on in the Science Capability Review was innovation. And uh, the, the message was that departments need to work out how to use innovation, which means specifically thinking about interaction with SMEs, with companies that are doing innovative work that might help government. And that's not easy because government likes to deal with big companies. It's easier from a procurement perspective. And of course, it carries less risk. So innovation was the fourth theme that I would highlight. Those themes in the Science Capability Review have been picked up really as part of government reform as well. And the government reform agenda um, talked about recruitment, skills, capabilities, tools, but it also said we should expect officials to ask how science can help. That's quite a big change. Asking officials in government to have as a first order question, how might science help in this problem? The second thing that I just put as a quote from the government reform agenda is to encourage considered risk taking to find new ways to solve challenges. Critically important, very difficult to do, and maybe something we'll come back to in questions, but it is crucial. The third document which is relevant is the integrated review which was published last year, which was a statement of uh, the position that UK wants to operate 
in, in the world. And there was an entire chapter in the integrated review on science and technology and science and technology was woven through indeed all of the other chapters as well. That's quite a big change. It was an important statement. It was an important observation about where science and technology plays a role in modern government. So my conclusions for this first part are, first of all, science and technology is absolutely ubiquitous. It involves virtually every decision that local or central government needs to think about. And indeed, our lives are affected by science and technology in nearly every way. The second is that it has been historically somewhat neglected in government. And the third is that it's now a priority, and you can see that in the documents that have been released over the past couple of years. So I want to move to a case study. And like all good case studies, and like many scientific papers which show illustrative graphs of things, illustrative uh, records from experiments, this is a completely exceptional case study that bears no reality to most others. And of course, the case study is COVID. In January 2020, <clears throat> ministers faced an unknown virus, uncertainty with virtually no information on key areas, and the need for rapid decision making. What was required was a range of scientific input. It required social science, virology, public health, epidemiology, genomics, clinical medicine, many other areas. And this needed to be integrated. It's no good having those as separate things. This needs to be an integrated view of what the science advice can say. The advice needs to be objective. It needed to be evidence-based as far as was possible. And it needed to be in the form of scenarios. And the scenarios are important in science advice because they start to allow decision makers to think about what ifs and which directions thing might go in, things might go in. Critical to science advice is the issue of uncertainty. And there was huge uncertainty at the beginning of this. But what people need to know is what do we know? What don't we know? Where are the big uncertainties? And how and when might those uncertainties become less uncertain? And then the final sort of general thing on advice was public support was obviously going to be crucial. And Science was going to be important for trying to think about public support, but also it made transparency an absolute necessity. And I think that the transparency of science advice is crucial because it allows an understanding of why policy has been made and which other things have been taken into account. So ministers have to integrate the science advice they get with all the other inputs they need to think about, political, economic, ethical, moral, philosophical, the things that they must think about in order to make decisions, of which science advice is one input. And all of this had to happen in pretty much real time. So what are the observations? And I've got five observations I want to make from uh, some of those uh, experiences. The first, is that data is absolutely critical. And at the beginning of the pandemic, there was virtually no data. It was impossible to even know how many people were going into hospital. I mean, just think about that. That is an extraordinary thing, situation to be in. It was difficult to find that out at the beginning. I have to say the data streams became extremely good and very sophisticated and are probably amongst the very best in the world now. So data, Data integration, data flow, ability to see those data were critically important. The second is there were many, many unknowns and aligning research efforts early was crucially important. And being able to get money out of the door to people to undertake studies and to get answers was very important for everything from vaccines through to uh, clinical studies through to ability to get pieces of work done, integrating social science, behavioral science and others to try and get answers to questions. That I think is a key lesson that led to the formation of national core studies and the national core studies were an attempt to define what are the big questions that government wants answers to and give groups of academics money to go away and try and answer those 
and they joined up with industry, they joined up with government people, they joined up with people from PSREs. And those groups have actually formed incredibly powerful research groupings. And when I speak to them now, they say they've worked in a way they'd never worked before. Really focused on what the big question was that they all needed to answer and able to work with each other in a way that is often quite difficult and indeed to get funding for things like that in an integrated way that are often quite difficult. The third sort of observation I'd make is one about science and politics. Science is a process of understanding what you don't know, trying to find out what the answer might be, and then being delighted and surprised when you find out you were completely wrong and something, something was different from what you expected. That in politics is a horrible U-turn. <laughs> so that difference between scientific method politics and indeed media is an important one and is not just true during a pandemic. The fourth area of observation would be how important international collaboration is and science is an international endeavor. And we met very frequently with our colleagues from around the world. And uh, surprise, surprise, we were all facing exactly the same questions and had often very similar approaches to trying to answer them. And my observation would be that the science advice was pretty similar everywhere. We, we really didn't have much difference in terms of what we thought was going on between most of us as we spoke, but of course policy outcomes were different and for all sorts of reasons. The other observation on the international front was that there was one unifying thing that we discovered very early on, which is um, <clears throat> politicians find exponential curves extremely difficult. And this was true across the world. The final observation I want to make is about advice versus policy versus operations. And um, one of the complexities of the last two and a half years has been many commentators and indeed many scientists have failed to distinguish between those three things. And uh, giving policy advice is fine, but it's policy advice, it's not science advice. And giving commentary on operational aspects is fine, but it isn't science advice. And so I want to just dissect those three a little bit. What happened with science advice? Well, as you will know, one of the things that was set up, and it's set up in an emergency uh, under, under any conditions of an emergency which requires cross-government effort is SAGE, which is Science Advisory Group for Emergencies. And SAGE is not a standing committee or a committee that has members. It has actually participants who come together for whatever the problem is. And in this case, uh, many of those people have met over 100 times in the last two and a half years. Normally when SAGE is called, it may meet two or three times for something. That brings together though, different disciplines in an integrated way to try and get some consensus view on what the science is saying. And underneath that, there are working groups in different disciplines, whether that's viral transmission, infectious disease, spread epidemiology, whatever. So we had subgroups, we had hundreds of people working on this, all volunteers, all from uh, universities or industry. And uh, that fed into SAGE and that advice was then fed into government and published so everyone could see it. And, and I now know that people in many other countries would read that advice and use it as well. That was one form of science advice input. There were also individuals who would input. There were of course discussions that took place and there were other uh, operational groups that would have views uh, that would be fed in as well from Public Health England through to NHS and others that would feed information in. But the point of SAGE was to try and integrate some of the key areas and bring it up in a unified way. Policy was really complicated. And you know, for those of us who aren't involved in policy, I can tell you from my perspective, it is really difficult to transfer an idea into a policy. And this was super difficult because it was multi-departmental, it crossed every department in Whitehall, very, very difficult to uh, make, uh, make work. And of course, to get the science advice into every department meant that there needs to be a chief scientific advisor in every department who could take that advice into departments. And I'll give you an extreme example to show you how many different parts of Whitehall were affected by this. 
uh, I was at uh, an award ceremony in Whitehall for some people who'd done a great piece of work and I was chatting to them and they'd been working on the TV and film industry for COVID. And I thought, what on earth was that? And the answer was, of course, it was impossible to make any television without insurance because you can't, car you know, you can't carry the cost of if the whole thing falls over and nobody could get any insurance for making a television program because if somebody got COVID, the whole thing would be called off. So they designed a system to allow production companies to continue making television programs with some government underlying support so that they didn't have to take all the risk themselves of the whole thing falling over because somebody caught COVID or new rules came in. And I, I think I probably speak for most of us when I say actually having some good television to watch during the last two and a half years was quite important. And then the final bit is operations. And I want to give you um, one example. Very early on in the pandemic, um, the science advice was, we absolutely need to have a way of monitoring how many people have got this disease, where they are in the country, which ages they are, and what's happening to them. Pretty obvious, but an important piece of advice. Operationally, that's pretty difficult to make happen. Public Health England was stretched beyond all belief, having had many years of reduced funding and were simply eventually unable to do that. And the Office for National Statistics stepped in and said, we think we can do it. And within probably two weeks of that decision being made, the ONS study was set up. And that study has been crucial for being able to monitor the pandemic in the UK and indeed uh, other countries have used it extensively. Science operation is different from science advice. It needs a different structure. It needs people who really know how to run things inside the organizations they have. And it's a crucial part of the system. And I would just add, I think the local government aspect of this is important. I think it's really crucial that some of this stuff is embedded in local local um, delivery as well. So my, my messages around this bit are docking points for science are really important. It's all, you can have all the science advice you, you like, but if it doesn't dock into a clear, consistent, coherent place, it's not going to make a difference to policy. And across Whitehall, there are two mechanisms for this. In this case, it was central science advice into the central COVID task force policy team and it was departmental chief scientific advisors taking advice directly into departments plus as I say various organizations that have their own inputs as well. It's also important that when science advice is given there are some levers that are pulled and when you pull the lever the lever doesn't come off in your hand um, and I think the operational side of this has been crucially important. I want to give you one example of that. And again, an extreme example, which I think is overused as uh, an example of how bits of government should run. But there are definitely some lessons that are crucial, and that's the Vaccines Task Force. Now, the Vaccines Task Force was set up because the science advice was clear. Vaccines were a very good bet as a way to try and get out of this doesn't mean that there was definitely going to be a vaccine in fact anyone who knew anything about vaccines put a pretty low probability of getting a vaccine but everyone knew we had to try policy was clear which is give us a vaccine we'd like to give it to lots of people operationally incredibly difficult and it was clear quite early on that just allowing this to sort of meander was not going to give us what we needed and so the vaccines task force was set up it included people from industry and elsewhere with a very clear objective, get vaccines by the end of the year in quantities suitable to give to as much of the population as possible the following year. And I'm not going to go into great details of this, and Kate Bingham has spoken about this a lot, but I will give you my seven points that I pulled out from uh, the vaccines task force that I wrote down in 2020 as to the reasons that I thought um, this worked and, and things that I think are lessons that are worth thinking about. First of all, it brought content experts in rapidly. So experts were brought into government at pace. That's not easy to do at normal times. They took an at-risk investment mindset, a portfolio mindset. The National Audit Office have congratulated the Vaccines Task Force and said oh, what a great idea it was and how well it went. I wonder if they would have done that had it failed. And there was a very strong chance it would have failed. So there's a question there about how you make that work. 
It involved not just a simple procurement question, but it took R&D and manufacturing under its wing and said, we need to get all of this right. It had a clear outcome objective, which I've already described. It had single point accountability that was empowered in the, in the form of a single person, Kate Bingham saying, you've got to please deliver this. It shamelessly brought in the private sector, which was crucial because they were the people who knew how to do this. And it, at the outset, knew what its legacy was going to be. It had to leave a vaccine capability stronger than when it started for long term. And I think those seven points are relevant to other things, operational things that government might think about. So what were the general lessons that might be learned that are relevant to other situations of science advice? I've said one, data, data visualization, absolutely key. And I just want to read you something that, that again was published just before I took up office and struck me as being important. It was in the journal Nature and it was by Kofi Annan. And he was talking about data visualization. And he said, the results alone are astonishing, especially for me, an African accustomed to international headlines depicting a continent consumed by war, famine and hunger. The Africa shown in these maps, and he was talking about a data visualization tool showing all sorts of different parameters to do with Africa. The data shown in these maps tells a different story, one of measurable steady progress on problems long thought to be intractable. And I think the notion of using data visualization to help policymakers understand some of the underlying trends is crucially important. Second area is that science advice needs to define its boundaries. So science advice isn't advice that leads to a decision, it's an input to a decision. It needs clear docking points and it needs to be linked to thinking about what the operational outcomes would be. But absent defining the clear boundaries, you end up with meandering advice. And certainly if you look at some of the commentary uh, from uh, many parts of the scientific community, it meandered all over the place. You know, it didn't like policies, fine. You can all not like policies, but that's not science advice. It has to be cross-disciplinary and it has to include diversity. You cannot have monolithic thinking if you're gonna give science advice, you need to be able to get challenge in the system. It needs to deal with uncertainty and that uncertainty needs to be closely linked to the ability to fund R&D to try and settle that uncertainty or at least get more insight into it and that needs to be done speedily. And transparency is crucial. My view is that science advice should be published, and I think that helps policymakers. It actually makes it easier to understand why decisions have been made, and actually it's perfectly reasonable for policymakers and ministers to decide to go off in a different direction. That is the democratic right they have to do that, but at least the scientific evidence ought to be out there for people to see. And you need to get the people the scientists and engineers in the meetings about policy and other areas. Don't turn to them when there's a scientific problem only, because only by them hearing what's actually going on can they say, ah, okay, there's something here that we need to do something about that we can have an input into. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about um, policy for science. And I want to talk about the application of science. So I'm not gonna talk about the funding of basic research and I'm gonna take as a starting point that the UK has a very, very strong, and it's one of the areas that I think we can genuinely call world-class, strong university and research institute base in this country, which we must protect and uh, needs to be grown. But, that is not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's about how you think of the application of the science to something useful for society. If you look at the number of companies that the UK has in the top 100 globally, we've dropped from fifth to 10th place in the last couple of years. We're doing much better in terms of startup companies and venture capital investment. Indeed, it's gone up tenfold since 2010 with many more startups. We still have on average for a startup company, about nearly four times less private funding for each startup. So they tend to be a bit undercapitalized, but actually when you get to scale up companies, so when companies grow to a stage when they start becoming independent, we're about nine times lower than the US. 
So we're simply not scaling the companies that we have. If you look at the FTSE, it's basically pretty flat. If you look at high-tech NASDAQ companies, they've grown enormously. So we're missing out on an opportunity of our science base taking it through to the position it could be in. And one of the things in government is that science is fragmented. I've already said it's in every single department. Well, how do you pull together science in every single department? How do you get some coherent view as to what it is you want to do? And I think there's fragmentation horizontally, in other words, it's in every department, and vertically in terms of not thinking about the other aspects of science, which are everything from, of course, skills, but things like procurement, government procurement as a way to pull through innovation, application, demonstrators, ability to get things out at scale. So there's a need for horizontal and vertical integration, and it's a cross Whitehall uh, necessity. And that's really why the new National Science and Technology Council was formed, which is a prime ministerially led uh, cabinet committee focusing on science and technology, because this is a prime ministerial issue. It's as important as national security, the economy overall, and it needs to be something that any incoming prime minister has on his or her desk on day one. And it needs to be long term. There's no good chopping and changing every couple of years. That's not going to make this work. It needs to be a long term strategy. And therefore, essentially, it needs to be cross party as a concept so that it gets some degree of continuity. It needs to be able to look at all levers that government can pull not just how much money goes into UKRI or funds academic research, but the levers around companies and the ability to grow companies. So that's what NSTC is about. And the supporting infrastructure is the Office for Science and Technology Strategy, which is all in its infancy, but I think needs to be an established part of the landscape. And then the final point on this is I'll say, I've used the word world-class. We need to have an independent view of where we really are in different areas. And so when somebody says we're world-class, we need to be able to say, well, actually, you know what, we're not. And this is the reason we're not. And this is something that's been established now for the past 18 months, a, a, science, technology, um, a science and technology insights group that is establishing a, a, a standard methodology of being able to look at areas and give us independent advice into government, however uncomfortable that is, as to where we really are in different areas. So I will end by coming back to place productivity, decision-making and progress and argue that science and technology is core to all of those things. And that unless governments are scientifically enabled, they will suffer and not be able to do what needs to be done. And I think several of the right building blocks are in place but I don't underestimate the effort that's going to be needed to make sure that we really do take advantage of the truly world-class academic base we have and how that can translate into benefit for society. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, very much. And there were tantalizing threads throughout that presentation. I think we will want to pull on some of those uh, in the question period. So open to questions uh, from the floor. And we definitely have some already coming in online. Right over here, please. Keep going, Keep going from the Thinking the Unthinkable project. So Patrick, um, I know this was just before you actually took over in your job. But I remain intrigued as to what really happened to the exercises within government for a pandemic. The Cygnus um, exercise in, I think, 2016 produced, brought together 950 officials right across government. And I'm wondering if you can create a context for what you've just said for what government really does, because Sir John Aston earlier today said, you need political decisions by political leaders. And ultimately I'm an outsider. Obviously the, re the recommendations of the, that Cygnus um, uh, uh, exercise were not taken up mainly for financial and internal reasons. And when you mentioned Kate Bingham, yeah. 
And she did give this excoriating speech at Oxford back in November about what doesn't really work in government and what she needed. She needed to bring people in from outside. Yeah, so on Kate, and, and uh, I'm delighted that I was responsible for bringing Kate in for that very reason. And I've said uh, on my lessons for the Vaccines Task Force, being able to bring experts in at speed, I think is critical. So completely agree with her on that. Um, I joined in, in, in 2018, so I, I, don't, I wasn't there when Cygnus took place. Fortunately, I've got Chris Wormold here, who's the Permanent Secretary at the Department of Health, so he might want to comment on this. But, um, but I, I do think it's, 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 a, it's, I'll tell you what I think is interesting about this question, and it's important, is advice, policy, operations. And I think the question is the operational one. You know, it, what happened operationally that put in place the mechanisms or didn't put in place the mechanisms that were needed. And I think that is the key question around all of this. And I think that's why actually I wanted to emphasize the vaccines task force uh, example, because it's operational translation of an outcome, which is crucial and reports themselves don't give you solutions. But I don't know, Chris, whether you want to comment or whether you'd like to run for the hills. Uh, can we get a microphone over here, please? Thank you very much. Um, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you the questions I was going to ask. I mean, very annoyingly, Patrick, you didn't say anything I disagreed with. So, uh, <laughs> so I was hoping to be able to have a row with you. But, um, um, I think there's a really to be quick because we have a lot of people. Yeah, who want to there's a really us. interesting thing that came out of what you said, which I was going to ask you to reflect on, actually, that um, which go, does go to the planning question, that when you look at what we were good at in the pandemic and what we were not, it exactly matches what you would have said pre-pandemic. We're actually, as a country, really good at vaccines. We're really bad at diagnostics, et cetera. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's been a lot of emphasis on planning, but actually what is the underlying resilience of your science base? I think what has been proved is that is much more important. And I'll, I'll, what, what the question I wanted to ask you, and it goes to that, is actually what can we do to create a more resilient science base in peacetime, both for its own sake and to help deal with the emergency? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be very brief on this. I mean, I mean, I think if you actually look at where we were on vaccines at the beginning of this, we were not in a good position, actually, and we were in danger of losing the vaccine capability. Um, and I think it comes back to the difference between what is the advice versus what is the operational delivery against that? I think that's what we've got to focus on. I don't think it's enough to have a report, a desktop exercise that tells you something. I think you've got to dig in and say operationally, companies, academia, government, are we actually in a position to be able to run this properly? That's an operational question and one that I think is crucial as we look at future risks. Thank you. If you'd bring a mic over here, uh, thanks very much, right at the front. But I'm going to ask a question from the online audience. Uh, it's a difficult one. How do you manage, is the word here, or deal with people who spread misinformation? Well, um, I don't think you can necessarily manage people who spread dis disinformation. I think it's very, very important that uh, information that is trusted is presented as openly as you possibly can and consistently and I think throughout the pandemic of course there have been lots of sources of misinformation and there always will be but I think the vast majority of people actually have listened to the information not the misinformation and I think what you shouldn't do is give lots of space for misinformation to circulate without the true trusted value judgments to be and, and comments to be out there as well and that's why I think transparency of advice is really, really important. And I think, honestly, I, I think a loss is made of the misinformation that the anti-vaxxer community, for example, is pretty tiny, actually. Right here. That goes perfectly to what I was hoping to ask you about. First, thank you. Um, when I came out of Oxford, I was recruited into one of those fast track programs for Canada's government. And um, we started a new department in natural resources ministry called science and policy integration. And I was heading up international affairs. And our metaphor, which fits perfectly with what you've just said, was that science was packaged up, a pin was stuffed into it, and it was thrown over to the policymakers who would find it and pull the pin out <laughs> and see what happened. And you've just given an exactly crucial picture of 
how not to do that anymore. And so I wanted to tempt you. I'm the Lieberhume Visiting Professor here in the Bennett Institute. And I've sort of fallen forward into academia and I'm teaching international law and climate change. And, and, and I'd love if you could just say a few more words um, from a regime perspective on those docking mechanisms and on international cooperation on science. And it's because of the global challenges we face, like the pandemic, like disrespect for international law and invasions, like climate change, that I think that we have to get this right now. And yeah, I'm not sure. Thank we you. Uh, well, so, so the docking mechanism point, I think, is critical. And, and, and I think there is a tendency for a report to be written, and that's the end of the job. And I think what you can't do is do that. You need to make sure <laughs> who is the recipient of this report or piece of information. They need to be softened up because people, you know, can't be hit cold with it. So actually, it, I'm afraid it's a rather boring, old-fashioned thing of relationship building and then being very clear that if the docking mechanism looks vague and as though it's gone to six people who say that they're all in charge of something, meaning nobody is, that you come back and challenge it and say, who really, how, how really is this docking mechanism working? So I think the docking mechanism point is absolutely critical and it needs to be in a language that is mutually understood. Um, uh, so that's, that's the principle. The practice of that is quite difficult. So the, uh, there's a question online, which I think builds on that, which is if you, if you don't then think about the docking mechanism, but about the other side and the provision of, of scientific advice, would you like to say more about how that can best be prepared, given forward from an academic standpoint, so that it can actually find receptive docking? Yeah, uh, the, the first thing to say is, and, and I can say this, having spent 20 years as an academic, the bit of research that you've just done that's super interesting is not science advice to government. Uh, however important you know it is, and you know how it's going to change the whole world, that is not science advice to government. And uh, most science advice to government is actually about um, evidence synthesis across a broad range of, of, of topics and compiled in a way that meets a policy need, or if it doesn't meet an existing policy need, it is one that is designed to stimulate a policy thought to try and get it to be a policy need. And um, I think that's why I th the system, I believe, in the UK government does work, which is to have a chief scientific advisor in every department with a system around them. And they are well connected with the academic world and they're a good route to try and work out if you've got an area that needs policy consideration or could help, that's a good way to get it in. Um, of course, if you fire off the individual bit of research to an individual minister, you might get a very excited response that is unlikely ultimately to lead to a policy, uh, policy change, I suspect. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions, I think, uh, right here in the center. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Arnoldus. I'm a policy manager at the Chartered Institute for IT. And my question is about the intersection of policy, science, and technology. I think um, arguably the age of the nation state as the unchallenged leader is in its twilight years. We're seeing more uh, technology, big tech companies specifically, um, having more and more power, more and more influence in this world. And, you know, we're fighting algor algorithms. And especially in this country, we are way behind the curves in understanding algorithms and regulating alg algorithms. So my question is, how should we as scientists, as policymakers, adapt to the change and the challenges that we are coming across in terms of algorithms? So, for example, an algorithm which favors, um, you know, what's popular, which in often, most cases, it's something that's hateful and divisive, mm. rather than what's true and what's evidence-based. How do we adapt to that so that we don't uh, lose control of truth and evidence-based science as the world evolves to a more tech-based world? Yeah, I mean, it's an incredibly important question and a very big question. Um, and there are some glib answers to it. Uh, and, and clearly, regulation is, is important in this space, but it needs to be truly informed regulation and it needs to understand the science and technology. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges here. It's much easier, in my view, to do this if you also understand and have a thriving industry in your own country. And so I do think we need to keep pushing 
startups and growth companies in tech areas because we will develop a capability and, and an understanding and we'll have skilled people who've been involved in those industries who know where the problems are and i think that's why if you look at something like the pharmaceutical industry in this country we've got superb regulation the reason is we've also got very big companies and lots of startups people understand it if you're trying to regulate an area that you've got no expertise in it's very very difficult and uh, particularly so in algorithms for all the reasons you've said and we are of course pretty good at those and we've got great companies like DeepMind and others here. So we are getting experts. And I think those experts is an exact example of where you need to bring experts into government quickly to, to look at this, not to rely on generic policy expertise. These are deeply technical, difficult areas, including ethicists, of course. Time for one last question right back there. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Anshuman from Innovate UK, also an alumnus of the university. Uh, just wanted to find out uh, your thoughts on the role of science diplomacy uh, in sorting out some of the issues that you highlighted that the UK potentially has. Uh, possibly touch upon your experiences with other national security advisors in this regard. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, well, um, there is a chief scientific advisor in the uh, uh, FCDA, the Foreign Office, uh, for uh, that very reason that, that I think science diplomacy is seen as important and uh, I've got quite strong views that actually it's much easier to get science relationships going between countries than other types of relationships and we should use it more and I also think science relationships are often a good prelude to, to trade deals because you start to have the sort of tech people speaking to each other so I'm a big fan of, of, of making sure that we use a, we've got a very extensive science network across the uh, embassies around the world uh, that we're trying to get into a sort of more coherent space to look at both what the desires are from this country and what the input is from the countries where the embassies are. Um, and my experience during the past two and a half years is my relationships with chief scientific advisors, whether it's on climate, where we produced a letter uh, and a statement pre-COP26, or whether it's on COVID or anything else, those relationships are really, really important. And the UK is trusted in this space and people actually want to interact. And so I think there's a big opportunity around science diplomacy, uh, but I do think science diplomacy needs to be linked to true scientific objectives. In other words, I, I don't think it's very good when you're just using it as a diplomatic tool on its own. It has to be linked to some genuine scientific technology need. We're about to move into a very short final session with uh, Peter Bennett and uh, Diane Coyle. But before we do that, please join me one last time in thanking Patrick Garland.